The Special Education Alliance is excited to bring you our speaker tonight. Chris Koberlein, a project consultant with the Montgomery County Intermediate Unit. From the first steps to the last steps, developing self-determination skills during the school years. Take it away, Chris. All right, Sandy. Um, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Um, thank you for taking time out of your schedules. Um, as Sandy said, I'm a project consultant for um, the Montgomery County Intermediate Unit. Um, but my most important role that I have in life is that of a husband and also a father of three. Um, I have uh, also almost, I have a 24 year old, almost 25 year old son who is on the autism spectrum, who's gone through transition planning in life um, and who has developed self-determination skills, sometimes to his benefit, sometimes to mine, um, and sometimes where we're not necessarily seeing eye to eye, but that's a good thing because he is taking control of his life. So that first and foremost is about me is not only a project consultant, a professional lens, but I also bring a parent lens as well. Um, as we begin, I'm going to share um, um, an uh, a PowerPoint and a Padlet. I think that, Sandy, were they pushed out earlier? I did not push it out. I wanted to make sure they came first. Okay, so <laughs> if you want to send it out, you can. Um, but I will have a PowerPoint that will be sent out also with a Padlet and a list of resources that I'll cover. Um, the way I like to do presentations, if you have any uh, questions at any point in time, um, please feel free to put them into the chat box and at a natural stopping point, we'll, you know, certainly try to answer those questions to the best of uh, my ability as well. Um, the worst answer sometimes is I will, the answer that I'll give is I'll get back to you with that information if I don't know the answer. Um, so the way I set up the PowerPoint is we go through, um, I'm not one who likes to read necessarily word from word from the PowerPoint. It's a list of a way of presenting information, organizing the, the resources and information as well. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen and we will begin. Let's see. So that's Sandy put that into the chat box. Here's the list for the PowerPoint and also the Padlet. Um, so as we're here tonight, we're going to be looking at um, really what self-determination and its various components are. Um, we're going to really be talking about why self-determination and those component and those component skills are really, really important um, for individuals with disabilities to, to learn throughout the school year. Um, and when we talk about learning self-determination, it's not something that just is worked on when a student becomes of transition age. It's not something that just all of a sudden we start working on at 16 when a student gets a driver's license or when they're getting ready to um, graduate or exit out from special education services. Um, Self-determination skills are skills that can be worked on in, in the early part of childhood, in elementary school, in middle school, um, and throughout high school. Um, so as we look to, to define it, it's really the simplest terms is acting as the primary agent in one's life and being able to make choices and decisions um, regarding their life or one's life without undue influence or interference. Simplest terms, it, it's knowing and believing in yourself, knowing what you want your future to be and how to make plans, um, to, with, to achieve this future, um, knowing what supports that you need to take control of your life to the best of your ability. Um, so the next two slides, really, why do we look at the emphasis on self-determination? Um, when we look at um, self-determination skills uh, for young adults with disabilities, um, the higher level of self-determination skills that they acquire and that they develop and that they're able to maintain um, the research is pretty clear. Um, um, they're going to have the option for better employment opportunities. They're going to have options for better academic and learning opportunities. Um, they're going to have more positive experiences associated with those academic and learning opportunities. 
um, looking at self-determination, um, it's they're going to be able to actively more to the, to the greatest degree of their independence to be able to participate in, in that process um, of making those decisions and, and participating in those decisions that are about them to the fullest extent of their abilities possible. They're going to be able to, uh, to the fullest extent of their ability, be that decision maker. Um, and, and those are really important things it's for all of our lives that we look at and where it becomes important is we all want to be that decision maker and be the one who gets to decide um, where our journey goes um, and how that journey might take us and what paths that it might take us in life. Um, so self-determination refers both to the right and the ability to direct your own life. Um, and these are, this is really, really important as we start to look at for our students um, and our individuals, our young adults with disabilities. We want their voices to be heard. We want them to take ownership. Um, and, and the easiest way to, to look at it is when we get to take ownership of our own lives and you know plan and navigate and chart that path and that future, it's going to be associated with more higher levels of satisfaction than outcome. Um, it allows for quality of life decisions. Whether you're um, five, or whether you're 10, whether you're 12, whether you're 21, whether you're 44, or whether you're 66, or whether you're at the end of life. Um, the research is also pretty clear um, uh, in terms of associating um, higher levels of self-determination with um, for individuals with disabilities with also levels of income that they're going to be able to earn after they exit or graduate special education. Um, so the next few slides are going to be one of the things that's really important to me when we talk about self-determination is really through the lens of, of a youth or a young adult with a disability. Um, so these are all the next few slides. I'm just gonna highlight some of the key points, um, why self-determination is important from the viewpoint of an individual with a disability. Um, first and foremost, self-determination, as I've sort of alluded to, relates to success. Success is defined by who we are, what we believe in, and what it means to be successful. Um, and I think this quote here, um, we all want to chart our own paths. And for, for some of us in life, success might be different. Some it's being able to live independently and being able to support yourself, to make decisions regarding family, to look at income and education, um, and to fulfill and reach your own dreams. Um, so that's one of the, you know, as we look at through the, the lens of a youth, with disability, um, it's really important to help them dream for the future and see that how in that role and the component skills of self-determination help them um, achieve those dreams. Um, I think this next slide is one of the most important to me, um, not only as looking through a professional lens, but really through the lens of a parent um, and helping and shaping and you know, um, as us here tonight, a lot of us who are parents, um, helping our sons and daughters and our children um, shape their future um, through the lens of self-determination by setting goals. Um, I think to me, some, and I put them in bold, some of the most powerful words here, I'm still in the process of learning to stretch, um, but I start by identifying what I can do already do what I'm comfortable doing and feel good about. Then I say to myself, sometimes in writing, I can do more. Um, so, the, the, you know, it's looking what I can do and saying I'm here and I've started this. But I, if I do a little bit more, um, I'm going to foster those better outcomes in life, whether it's um, uh, to read a few more books in, in, a, in a page for an assignment, whether in school or whether preparing for college, whether it's taking a few extra steps, you know, and say my case, 
in, you know, someone in their mid forties to meet my doctor's um, goals for me sometimes. Um, I think having that ability to look at things and where we are and say, um, from a goal setting perspective, that it doesn't all have to be all or nothing, that there can be steps in that process um, as we navigate life. Um, you know, that journey might begin with a few steps, a few steps more, and, and then maybe it's one giant leap for mankind to sort of steal a quote. Um, but I think having that ability to set goals and what we're going to talk about through some of the component skills is to have a plan to achieve that goal is really, really important. Um, again, I think one of the other parts that for me, that's really important in this slide is then I write down those goals. Um, um, for me, it's important in my own life. And, and I've seen this through the lens of my son. Um, when, I, when I talk from a personal perspective is when something's on paper, it makes us reflect on that versus just say, I'm going to do this. But when we see it, you know, written down, when we see that goal written out, um, whether it's on paper, whether it's on, um, you know, for him, he does a lot of things on his cell phone. Um, it, 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 it keeps him sort of that eye on the prize. Um, as we relate to this, to our school settings, um, you know, this is one of the things that's going to become, um, for those of you who are not there yet, when we talk about transition planning, when your son or daughter might turn age 14, or if not earlier, depending on their individual cases, can be really, really important. Um, really setting those goals, setting those steps, um, developing those activities that relay into that transition plan, and also um, those uh, goals as part of that transition planning. Oops. Um, really self-determination, playing to your strengths. Um, so often, you know, as we look at everyone around us, we all have strengths, you know, focusing on those cans, ra cans rather than the cans. Um, what are those unique skills um, that we all have? What are our unique strengths? Um, you know, whether it's uh, for some of our individuals, you know, their memories, whether for some of our individuals with disabilities, um, their ability to use technology and resources, um, whether it's their ability to develop relationships. Um, that's one of the things that when we talk about self-determination, that becomes really important is really also building that social network of relationships. A lot of our individuals with disabilities are really good with developing and maintaining relationships, meeting people, interacting with people, remembering people names, remembering those environments. Um, so really looking at, um, as we look at self-determination, also, you know, in future life planning to look at it from a strengths-based approach. Um, I'm going to stop there for a second. Any questions so far? All right. Um, Self-determination and developing strategies. Um, the more often that I express my needs and preferences, the easier it becomes. Um, for a lot of our individuals with disabilities, the more that we practice, the more comfortable they begin or are able to um, be in situations. With self-determination skills, this is something um, and I, I can't say it enough, and, and I know some of you have heard me before, some of you, this might be the first time, um, with self-determination, with looking at some of the skills, um, component skills of self-determination, such as self-advocacy, this is something that we want to start early in life. And I'm going to talk about this through some different slides throughout the presentation. The more that we can get them comfortable to doing something, to, to express, to communicate, um, to make choices, to make decisions, to set goals, you know, to um, engage in problem solving activities, to utilize strategies for solving problems, to utilize natural supports. Um, the more doors that we're going to be able to open or the more doors 
that are going to open for them throughout their life um, as they chart the course. So in, in the essence, in a lot of ways, when we talk about these skills, we want to look at starting young, you know, in terms of self-determination, um, there's components um, that we're going to talk about that we can already be working on today um, with a lot of our um, children that we support. Um, so it's really communicating to them that we're going to start, we're going to support them, we're going to give them the strategies so ultimately they can communicate through their, their voice and whatever their voice might be and, and their form of communication, um, those opportunities. Um, Self-determination and risk-taking. Um, Nothing worthwhile comes without risk. Without risk, success cannot be achieved. I think, um, you know, and this is one of the things that I learned in my own life as a parent. And it probably took me longer than in, in some cases than it should have because I knew better as the professional, but as the parent, um, I had this idea that um, at times I needed to encompass this plastic bubble you know, I want to, you know, shelter. Um, I was afraid at times of letting my own son make mistakes. You know, what would happen, you know, if he fell off his bike? Would he get hurt for the first time? Um, as I've gone through not only my professional career, but seeing um, the lens of my son and, and, you know, you know, his life experiences, um, having them engaging those activities that are stretching those boundaries to, you know, take risks, to try new things, to, you know, do new things, to, you know, whether it's, um, you know, cooking in the oven for the first time, using tools, power tools for the first time. Um, in, in my son's case, it was being lucky enough and able to, dad and mom at 18, for the first time he came to us and finally said, I want to learn to drive. And ultimately it took a few years, but he did learn to drive. And, you know, it was one where I was like, oh my God, he's going to learn to drive. Um, it's a risk, but it's a risk that any other kid his age was going to want to take. Um, learning to utilize public transportation, um, a risk. Um, you know, can he go out, you know, be and independently navigate a bus and three changes to go from a to B to C to get to um, wherever he wants to go to the mall and be there safely. Me, the parents like, oh, well, I'll just take you. But for him, it's about creating and foster that choice. Dad, I, I wanna go by myself. I wanna, I wanna get from point A to point B without you or mom taking me. So it's embracing those risks, allowing them. A couple of times he missed the spot, missed the thing. Um, I missed, you know, the location. I've got to wait for the next bus or I went one spot too far. I've got to take the bus back. Um, and within that risk, he has become much more of a, a better navigator of public transportation than my wife or I. Um, the funny story, and for those of you who know me, please don't make fun of me when you see me again. But I still can remember the time my wife and I were in Boston and arguing over public transportation and he's looking at us laughing and we're going, why are you laughing at us? He's like, you don't know how to read the rail line. And we're like, nope, this is how you do it. Follow me. That's where the risk comes in, the risk taking. He knew how to help us with all the technology in the world. I still couldn't figure out the difference between the light rail and the other rail line in Boston on whatever lines they called it. So having risk taking, embracing those things. Um, sometimes we call it the word failure. Um, um, I don't necessarily like the word and I agree with the word not failure, but sometimes it's just opportunities to learn and keep on learning that can really come in handy. Um, and, and that comes with the idea and the concept of presuming competence as well. Um, and within that presuming competence, understanding that there's going to be times where there's going to be a productive struggle. And, and that really can be important as it comes into looking at self-determination and risk-taking. 
I see there's a couple things in the chat, so give me one second. Um, Sandy, and I, I think me commenting. No, but I think that commented. You, I think this is where I like to also let other people. Sandy, can you that last part? Can you talk about that? The the dignity of risk, or the mm -hmm. fact that you were embarrassed because your son. Uh, <laughs> oh, I I was smirking, but I think the dignity of risk. Can you talk about that? Well, it's just what you said that we learn from failures. So, and if you don't take risk, you 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 know you just don't learn anything new and i think as parents that's harder for us um you know i brianna does a lot of things or asked to do a lot of things that i'm in my gut i'm like so afraid to let her do but that's the only way and then we learn things if you know something doesn't go perfectly which is most of the time um there are skills that we can then teach her for the next time mm -hmm. and, and that's where that you know that bubble we can't keep them in that bubble forever we wish we could um, but at some point that bubble's going to, something's going to happen in that bubble and they're going to have to know how to respond and problem solve and, and, and engage in those other activities. So self-determination and relationships, um, as we look at self-determination, it, it's really identifying plans, setting goals problem solving. And one, one of the biggest things as we talk about self-determination and problem solving is the development of relationships. Um, there's that social capital piece, that social network piece uh, that can so often can come in handy. Um, whether it's looking at something or learning-based activity in a school setting, whether it's um, something at home, um, whether it's, you know, just in terms of making connections with people in life. Um, so it's really, really important as we look at some of this for our um, children to have that ability to develop uh, relationships within the context of different environments, inclusive environments, um, because those will carry forward with them, not only during the school years, um, but after they graduate or exit as well. So core components of self-determination. Um, this is a chart. I can't explain it any better. This is from a website called I'm Determined. Um, from uh, It's work out of uh, Virginia that's affiliated with the state of Virginia. It's a really, really great resource. Um, it's, it's part of it's the resources on Padlet as well, and I'll go over them at the end. Um, but this is, I just think, an incredible way to look at the core components of self-determination. Um, as you can see, some of the core components here that we're going to start out with are choice-making and decision-making. Um, choice-making skills um, really breaks down to the ability to demonstrate a preference within different environments um, and to demonstrate that control. Um, in, in looking at, there's really some benefits to choices, um, not only in a school setting, but at home. Um, really one of the things that research is pretty clear about choice making from a behavioral standpoint, um, decrease problem behavior, increase engagement. Um, you know, when we have choice in life, um, and, and I can say this in, in my own life, when you know, some, some days that I'm off and, you know, even my wife goes to work. And if I get a honey to do list, if I get a list of activities that I'm able to do and choose from versus one specific thing or what X, Y, and Z, I like the list where I get to do it in maybe in order that I want to do it. And, and, and I relate this to a lot of our kids. Um, for some, they want to maybe knock the easy thing out. Maybe it's math they find easier. They do their math in school. Um, or after school for homework. And then maybe they want to focus on the harder reading assignment for some of our kids. So they choose it that way. But for some of our kids, they might look at it a different way. I want to knock out the hard activity so that maybe I'm most fresh in school or I'm most fresh when I first get home from school and do that reading activity because I find it harder. And then because I find math really easy or easier, 
I'll do the math activity second. So promoting choices, whether it's in academic assignments, whether it's you know doing chores around the house, um, whether it's even what clothes you wear or foods you eat, um, really can be key components of skills that we want our students, our young adults, our children to learn. Um, ensuring choice-making opportunities, um, especially when we're starting out, we don't want to leave them to chance. Um, this is where even when we're working with students of a very, very young age where we can start to introduce the concept, you know, what color shirt do you want to wear? What type of pants? What type of shorts? Um, what type of sweatshirt? What type of sneakers? Um, you know, having them have say, in, you know, it, when we take them shopping today, um, um, and this is something I even have to remind my own teenagers that sometimes we're not going to shop on Amazon. We actually have to go into the store and try things on and see if they fit so that you can make that appropriate choice, which leads to a decision. Um, take every opportunity, you know, to allow them to make choices. What they wear, snacks, activities that they participate in. Um, um, one of the funny things that um, I look back for my own son, when he was um, early um, in his age, growing up in elementary school, we used to do the autism walk um, when it first came out. And the first year, he really enjoyed it. The second year, yeah, he, he was all right with it. The th third year, he came to us and really asked us, he was like, it's too loud. I don't want to do the, the walk anymore. And it's a choice that we acknowledged. Um, he was sort of right. When you have 10,000 people uh, on a parkway um, with loud music and, you know, people who are celebrating a lot of different things for some people that, especially for some of our individuals with autism, that's not necessarily a fun environment or a situation. So he made that choice. Um, as we talk about key, when we talk about choice making, just one of the key thoughts that I look like, key thoughts that I often express to people is you, you want to make it a true choice. Um, if we're looking at a young kid who's a picky eater, for example, when we're talking about self-determination and choice making, in most cases, broccoli versus cauliflower is not a choice. So it might be broccoli versus a fruit. But really, we want to make it so that we're giving a choice. We don't want to make it seem too similar, like, well, it's not really a choice. So just... That's one of the things when we're really introducing it, make it clear so there is some sort of level of choice making involved. Strategies, um, this can be modeling. Um, for some of our um, young adults, how we wanna model to make that choice, um, um, choosing what to eat, um, calling attention to what others might be choosing or others are selecting for clothes especially right now. Um, I know for some of our children that we support, this can be a, a difficult time of year, especially for clothes. And, you know, it's warm or it's cold in the morning, but it's, you know, really hot at the end of the day, you know, how to dress to make those choices as well, which can lead into decision-making as well. Um, sometimes it's giving advance notice um, of options to choose from. Um, really, for some of our uh, individuals, visuals are a great thing to use. Um, and, and that's one of the nice things now with technology where we're at now. Um, you know, we have visual menus, um, you know, preparing, you know, to go out to eat. We can have individuals prepared to make a choice, um, you know, by looking at the different things that might be on a menu um, before we even arrive at a restaurant or a location or a dinner. Um, um, so I think that's really giving as much information that we can for, for new settings can be really important to support students, whether in school or whether at home. Um, the other part of choice making uh, that we really want to make for some of our students who need communication devices is that we ensure that they're utilized, um, that they're ready to go, that they're charged um, as well, um, that they're accessible. Um, and used across different environments um, so that we're getting the, you know, the biggest bang for the buck 
with regards to the communication device as well. Um, opportunities to practice, um, you know, how they'll carry out learning tasks, um, where they'll complete their homework, with whom they might work with. Um, for some of our students, um, we might have to just start out with a small number of items for a snack or an assignment. It might just start out from a field of two um, in order to build that level of comfortability with choice making. Then we slowly might add another one. After that one, we might become add three or four things um, so that over time, systematically, we're exposing them to the idea that in some situations, that there's going to be multiple factors to make choices uh, about and that they have experience with that. Um, really giving them multiple options as well. Um, Decision-making, um, this is the next sort of skill after choice-making. Um, this is where we're looking at identifying different options and weighing the pros and cons. Um, this is where we really want them to start looking at the, the choices that are available in making that best decision um, based on the choices that they have. Um, and also going to involve where it's different is it's going to involve the students generating their own options between those choices. Um, what we're, and this is really, probably one of the best times of year for, for some of our kids to expose um, decision-making skills. Um, I talked about clothing, you know, um, can be a great opportunity where, you know, you get, um, and I can say from my own life where, you know, it was like, is it short weather? Is it pant weather? Um, is it sweatshirt weather? Is it long sleeve t-shirt weather? Or is it just t-shirt weather? Um, uh, you know, so exposing them, what are the pros or cons? If, uh, you know, if I wear just shorts and a t-shirt to school um, in the morning for the first four hours and waiting for the bus, I'm probably going to be cold. Now, if I layer, um, I'll be warm and then I can take a sweatshirt off and as the day progresses and, you know, not be cold in the morning, but not be too hot in, in the um, um end of the day where, you know, the sun's out and it's up to 70. Um, Decision-making, um, we, we look at this time of the year um, for some of us who celebrate Halloween or those type of events, you know, what costume might they want to be? Um, especially having, you know, you've got different choices, um, you know, which one of the Marvel um, super comic book heroes for some of our kids who are younger that they want to be, they ultimately, you know, they might want to be a couple different things. You know, we're not going to buy, you know, each one. Um, so they have to make a decision and allocate that resource. So we might model how we, we go through that decision-making process. We might give them that guidance in terms of looking at, at that as they make that decision. Um, in terms of even going out and doing some of their, you know, activities that are at this time of the year. Um, there's lots of activities, you know, in, in the fall, whether it's signing up for some of our kids throughout the year for different sporting activities or school activities. Um, do you want to do soccer? Do you want to do football? Do you want to do soccer or dance or cheerleading? Going through that process where there might not be enough time in the schedule to do everything. So really thinking about which one might best fit your schedule, might be best fit your time. Um, might also allow you to do, engage in other activities as well. Um, um, really, this is one where this is going to be a lifelong skill. Um, so sometimes um, we really want to have them reflect on and stop um, and think about some of the choices that they have available so that they can make the, the decisions. Um, um, teaching them sometimes um, as part of decision making, not to get caught up um, in their emotions and their behavior at the moment, to take a step back, uh, to breathe, to reflect. Um, um, and this might be in some of those situations where, you know, 
um, some of our children in elementary and, you know, into those middle school years when they're playing a game with friends and they get upset because maybe they didn't win the game or they're losing, uh, you know, within the group or the, the feeling that they're losing, that they just don't give up and quit, um, but they see through uh, the game and um, the setting or the situation, or, or for some of our students looking at, you know, the academic task um, in terms of um, mm -hmm. where they might be learning a new skill, whether in math or reading um, in, in, or reaching a, a level of frustration where we're teaching them about, okay, we can make, we can be frustrated, but when we get frustrated, what are the choices that do we have? Do we continue and continue to frustrate ourselves or do we look at making the decision? Uh, the other choice would be to take a break, um, take five minutes, get water, splash some water on our face, um, breathe, and, and then coming back to the activity. Um, the other part of that is making a choice where if I don't understand something to request assistance or to ask help as part of that decision making to really begin to have them reflect on um, those decisions um, so that they can begin to look at choices and make decisions uh, based on things that they're presented. Um, this is really one of the most important things with decision-making, having those opportunities to practice, you know, how to manage their time, um, whether it's, when they come home from school, um, are they gonna do their homework first and then go out and play? Or are they gonna take a break, and go out and play and then do their homework? Um, really having them see what, what's the end result, what works best for them and to learn. For some of our kids, they realize really quick that, hey, I'm better off if I come home, do my homework and then go out and play versus some where they, they need that time to, you know, stretch to get that large muscle movement. And then they're more focused when they're able to come back in after they've had some time. Um, having them decide what book to read, um, having them to look at sometimes making that purchase. Um, I, I don't know how many people here who have younger children or have had younger children where you look at some place like Dave and Buster's or Chuck E. Cheese, where they get 15 tokens or those points or those dollars. And then all of a sudden you're up at the window and it's like, oh my God, well, what do we have? What, what are we going to spend our tokens on? Or we have a gift card for $20, you know, and we go to Target and all of a sudden we have two things. One costs $21 and we don't have $21. We just have 20 or we have something for $18. Um, do we buy the thing that costs $18 or do we make the decision where we pocket the money and save up for two more dollars to make the $21 purchase the next time? Um, so as we look at those, giving them the, the opportunities to make decisions and, and understanding that some decisions are going to be um, wrong in the nature that it might not be the preferred initial outcome, but they're going to learn from those decisions and have that opportunity to, to have those experiences. I'm going to stop there. Any questions so far? I, I have just more of a comment. I, I appreciate how your, the, these skills are skills that really you can start really early. And, and I also love that there are skills that you could teach our kids with disabilities among their, their peers, because all of them need to learn that. And, and, I, and I think that's one of the most important things for a lot of things when we start, um, when we look at things like choice making, decision making, this isn't necessarily a disability issue, Sandy, as you're saying. These are things where, you know, I, I watch my own teenagers who still have fits where you know, they're losing a game and they want to quit or, um, you know, they're frustrated with a school activity or they're frustrated with an activity of life. Um, um, and, and I have one daughter who um, 
I'm not getting as much playing time as I, as I want. So what's your decision? Well, I want to quit. Well, unfortunately, I'm that mean parent in our household. You, you begin something, you see it through to the end. Um, so right now you have a decision to make. You can be grumpy and unhappy, or you can, as she repeats after me in the background, probably somewhere, work harder and improve myself and have a positive attitude about it. Yes. Um, but I think those are the things um, where choice making, decision making, some of these self determination skills. One, we want to experience that with you know other kids and other peers, and can be really really important. Having those other peer role models for some of our kids can be really important. Seeing some of these um, things through, um, having people around them, whether it's us as their parents or family members, um, to have them encourage these things as well. Um, I still remember the time where I sort of got in a fight with my mom about some of these things, you know, but I want to do this. And I'm like, well, we're going to let him make his choice, but I've already bought X, Y, and Z for Christmas for him. And I'm like, no, we need to hear his, you know, choices and wants. Um, and, and, you know, and, and I'm still guilty of that sometimes where, and, and, and as a parent, I can say there were times where, I was guilty throughout the teenage years and like, I'm just going to make this because it's going to make my life easier at this point in time. I'll be the first one. I'll raise my hand. I'm guilty. Um, and, and that's where at times where I've had to sort of check myself and, you know, luckily I've had a supportive partner, my wife, where we've sort of checked each other on that. Um, because sometimes that's where we get caught up um, in our own lives. It's like, if I just make this decision for him for right now, it's going to make my life easier. It'll make his life easier. And then we move on, but it's not helping him in the long run. And, and, and I'm, I'm going to sit here in front of you. I'm guilty. Um, and, and, and that's sometimes where we have to look at it too. Um, that extra minute or two that might cause us now is going to pay dividends down the road by really allowing for that. Um, again, just looking at activities, you know, um, even learning for some of our middle school kids, learning what time to go to bed, you know, um, you want to stay up late. Okay, make your decision. Um, but then the next day when we have to go and we have to be up at seven o'clock for whether it's school or whether it's for a weekend activity, um, don't be dragging because you've made your decision. Um and then we're going to talk about it. And, and that's really where, okay, so you stayed up late. You struggled getting up to, 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 to fulfill whatever responsibility or activity that you had. What did you learn from your decision? Um, and, and, you know, those things really come in handy um, because they are, get to experience that. They've got to make the decision. Um, and, and now they have to sort of um, understand that, their decisions in so many ways have consequences. Um, um, I'm going to see if this works. So I'm going to stop. This is about problem solving. Um, it's pretty funny. So if I can't, I'm going to try the sound. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. And now it's unavailable on my computer. Um, shoot. Sandy, are you able to bring that up? It won't let me access it because I have my IU computer and it's blocked through my IU computer. It's the elevator. So do you want me to go out to the browser, pull it up and then share screen? Yeah. Are you able to do that? I'm going to try it. You Do you want to? I'm going to do it. I don't want to take your time. So keep going and then I'll. All right. Uh, one second. Pull up. So the next area that we're going to talk about after decision making is problem solving. Um, when we talk about, oops, I got to share.
when we talk about problem solving skills, we're looking at the ability to effectively respond to and generate solutions. Um, the clip that Sandy's trying to bring up, and I don't know if it's going to work, is essentially you have a man who is um, on an escalator and the escalator, oh. You want me to try? Sure. Can you stop I'll stop sharing. sharing. Yeah. Yep. I just had it. What did I do with it? Well, we'll move on. If Essentially, if you get the time after the presentation, take a look at it. What it does is it shows a man who's on an elevator, the elevator stops working and he doesn't move. He gets stuck and he's just calling out for help. Um, and, and so what we want our kids to do is, is to, to figure out that problem. I'm on an elevator. 100 it's Republicans who worked in national security now endorsing Harris for president. She came up as a prosecutor. That's not it, Sandy. Um, but we want our, 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 our children, our young adults to begin to solve problems. Um, and to when, whether it's an academic problem, whether it's a life problem where, hey, um, the escalator stopped, um, whether it's what happens when the bus doesn't come on time. Um, I still remember there was a time where my son's school bus um, didn't come on time. And this is, he made the transition from a specialized mode of transportation to um, riding the regular bus route. Um, and we had happened to have a flood where I lived. So it was on an emergency delay for about 35 minutes or whatever. And he stood up there in the middle of January um, at the bus stop for 35 minutes. Um, so, and didn't really, you know, come back to the house or anything. So when we're dealt with those cards, when things don't go right or things aren't exactly how we see them, how do we problem solve through things? And, and this is probably something that we all see as parents in some way, shape or form. Um, what are some of the most common, if you're comfortable sharing in chat, what are some of the most common problems or situations that might arise for you or your children on a daily basis? What are some of those common themes that some of your children might face if you're comfortable sharing? You can put it in the chat box. So for, I can say for some of the things that I've experienced else, um, um, attitude, yep. Um, has anyone ever forgotten a homework assignment at school or a book or lunch, their backpack good, their Chromebook, yes. Or if they have their Chromebook, sometimes they might've forgot a charger. Charging said Chromebook, correct. So as we look at some of those things, as we look at problems, what do we do? Uh, what are, Do we sit there and do we wait? Do we sit there and do we um, look at things and you know really get upset about things? Or do we take steps to figure out what steps to take to, to rectify that problem? Um, and, and these are really important things. Um, the earlier that we begin are gonna help not only academically, but also really um, in preparation for future success in the workplace um, for a lot of our kids. What happens when, if I'm doing a job and I finish? What happens if I run out of material? What happens if I don't understand the directions uh, or the task at hand? Um, or I forget necessary items. Um, you, you, these are all things that sometimes are really, really important. Or um, for a lot of our kids, I did the homework assignment, but I forgot it at home. Or I forgot, you know, certain materials 
that I needed for the assignment. So as we look to teach problem solving, um, it's that, that ability. Um, why it's important learning to solve problems allows for increased competence and independence in school and the community. Um, again, going back to that example of riding the public rail, the public transportation system in Boston for my wife and I, where my son and his immaculate problem solving helped us out um, so that we did not continue just to look at which map and which rail to take. Um, also allows us to, you know, safely navigate different environments, um, especially, you know, as we look at whether it's going out into a different setting, um, a different, you know, if we're going into a bigger environment, say, you know, we all live next close to the King of Prussia Mall. If we're going to the mall for the day or going out to a theme park with friends and, you know, we get separated from that group, what are the things that we can do from a problem solving format or method? Um, strategies to support. We want to help children develop the ability to find that solution. Um, if they forget their um, assignment in school, can we get it from a friend and call a friend who might be in class with us? Um, re really have them reflect on the way that a problem might need to be solved or a challenging situation. Um, really looking at building the sort of that tools in the toolbox. Um, we have a lot of technology and a lot of information in our hands today. Um, teaching kids to be resourceful. Um, if you don't understand a math lesson, um, what can we do? Call a friend, um, look at up online where using a math textbook where there might be a, a video of the reteaching. Um, using certain applications now can help us. Um, even for some of our students who are struggling with reading the, the number of apps that are out there that help, can help with reading or help solve certain math problems. And, and within this technology, it creates greater access for some of our uh, individuals with disabilities as well. Um, so being able to use some of those tools in the toolbox, um, looking at um, being able to generate a list of solutions, especially teaching uh, some of our younger children Okay, we have a problem arise. What are steps that we can take to solve that problem? Um, sort of thinking like that, thinking like a millionaire, that old game show. You know, can we ask a friend? Can we phone a friend? Um, can we eliminate some of the choices if it's an academic assignment and then be able to select that best answer? Um, for some, it's working to teach some of those conflict resolution strategies and skills. Um, there's often times where we might become frustrated um, or upset with another person. Uh, how can we work to solve those problems? Um, looking at things from sort of that executive lens as well. Is it a little deal? Is it a big deal sometimes in, in sort of a, a situation um, and having them reflect on that, those processes as well can be really important. Opportunities, um, if they forget their homework, what can we do? Um, you know, if we don't have a preferred um, food item or breakfast item, um, I don't know if we have any um, parents who have picky eaters. Um, mine initially in his early years was really picky. It was almost like Sheldon from the Big Bang Theory where Monday was like French toast, Tuesday was pancakes, Wednesday was waffles. Um, and there were times where maybe I made a mistake and forgot to get to the grocery store. Um, uh, other things, uh, what happens if you're in a room and the light bulb goes out? Um, those type of things, what can we do? Um, some of these things, if we look to practice problem solving, one of the things that we can do is and do uh, sort of sabotage. It's an actual teaching strategy or intentionally sabotage the environment to encourage the promotion of problem solving skills, um, such as uh, there were a few occasions where I did take the light bulb out of his lamp in his room so that he would have to communicate. Um, I need, um, it's dark in my room and I need a, a light bulb. It needs to be changed. Um, 
having them focus on some of those things um, where we talk about sabotage for some of our students, um, especially uh, some of our students who might have um, hearing, um, be who are deaf or hard of hearing, um, sometimes teaching them to use those problem solving skills. If they have a device that requires, such as an FM device that requires the use of the batteries and taking the batteries out, um, so that they have to problem solve those things through their te technology. Um, I know it sounds mean sometimes, the idea and the concept of sabotage, but if employed uh, effectively with a plan, it can be really productive within the context of environments. Um, looking at, you know, if they run out of soap, um, you know, some of this personal hygiene skills that a lot of us with parents whether it's kids with disabilities or without, we know um, sometimes they don't necessarily um, take into account. Um, looking into if they forgot to bring in a, a permission slip. Um, for some of our kids, um, if they're taking a test and they're running out of time or they think they're running out of time, what can they do? What steps can they do in the, the classroom as well? So really, Teaching problem solving skills across the context of the different environments, both in school and at home, can really help foster those independent living skills. Um, here's just a simple method, a format for solving problems. They call it the ideal problem solver. Identify the problem, define the goals, explore, explore possible strategies, sort of anticipate outcomes, look back and learn. So it's one method um, that you can look to help um, generate problem solving as an approach. Um, goal setting, identifying an objective and really developing that a plan. Um, one of the most important parts of goal setting, especially when introducing um, for, for a lot of our students is having them understand that for most people, for adults, um, looking to reach or achieve a goal is about a series of steps rather than one single step. Um, it's, it's not an all or nothing thing. Um, for uh, a lot of our kids that I, I work with who are transition age, um, it's about the steps to prepare for the future. It's not one step. You know, if someone has a goal to attend college, what, what are the steps that we're going to take to help pre prepare them for that? Um, it might be the development and enhancement of their academic skills in reading and math and writing. It might be the development of their study skills. It might be the development of their time management skills um, in, in terms of the test taking skills. So it's really sometimes for a lot of things, if we can make it into a more manageable steps, and really help build and foster that sense of success and to build that behavioral momentum in the long run, it's going to help them become more successful and, and to, to really see the benefits of setting goals. Um, you know, I can say and relate it to a personal example. Um, if I go to my doctor today for my annual physical and he says, Chris, you need to learn lose 50 pounds by... November, I'm probably not going to really be too thrilled with that goal and probably not give it much thought. Now, if he says in a manageable way, let's do X, Y, and Z, and let's look at, you know, uh, a two pound weight loss over the next two weeks before November comes, it's probably a little bit more manageable for me and I'll probably be a little bit more agreeable. Um, so it's so important when we're bringing in and teaching those um, concepts relating for goal setting to really show them and have them be successful with it. Four steps, sort of goal setting method, identify the goal, um, write the goal. Um, for some of our students, it might be writing the goal on paper. It might be drawing um, can be. Um, for some of the students that I've, that I've worked with in the past um, who don't like to write, drawing things out or creating a vision board can be really a powerful tool um, as well um, for setting this goal setting method. Um, there's a lot of um, 
pretty neat things. Canva is an application online. It's a computer program that has a lot of unique and creative ways to create a vision board that could be used as a goal setting method as well. Um, within that, creating that action plan and then evaluating and adjusting progress. Um, for those of you who are not um, of parents of transition age yet, this is what you're, you're going to be looking into as part of your transition planning when you start to develop um, that transition plan as part of the IP, as part of planning for the future. In essence, this is what the IP document is as well. Um, but as we start to really look at the long-term picture, um, these are some of the things that we want to start to look at and to start to do as well. Um, cool. My one sort of statement, a goal without a plan is just a wish. Um, so we can talk about doing X, Y, and Z. I can talk about, you know, doing this, um, but I really want to put things down into um, paper or some other format to develop that plan for uh, taking those steps to achieve that goal. Um, strategies to support, you know, for children. Um, one of the, the easiest ways to look at um, is having them save up for an item, you know, whether it's, you know, money that they obtain from chores, whether it's money they obtain for from birthday presents or holidays or other um, type activities, um, having them save up to make that larger purchase can be um, a, a great way to show them um, how to set a goal and then to achieve a goal. Within that construct, one of the things that we really wanna focus in, on is not the end result, but that process. What steps did you take? Well, I got money from my birthday. I got money from my chores. I got money because I write leaves for the next door neighbor. And when I combined everything and put it together, then I had enough money um, to pay for um, that Roblox gift card that I needed for, or that um, other gift card app that I needed to use for those um, to uh, purchase that game app for, for my phone or my device as well. Um, again, helping them set manageable and realistic goals that can be met in a shorter time. Um, if, uh, having them say, well, I'm going to set a goal from a year from now to, to purchase something is not going to be realistic. Um, you know, we want them to have as many opportunities to set goals, but then to achieve those goals and to see that success associated with that and to really build that momentum. Um, one way from an academic perspective um, that we can show them in, uh, is to really have them chart, graph some of their academic um, success, um, to have them look at you know, the report cards, to publicly display them, to, you know, for if they're gaining success in a particular area. Um, this can be, um, when I began my career in education, I had a professor who talked about the concept of small victories. Um, and, and that's really important for some of our kids, not only in a regular ed environment, but for a lot of our individuals with disabilities. Celebrate that first step, celebrate that small victory um, towards a goal. Um, you know, whether it's you learn five new words this week, whether it's um, you managed your time effectively and you got all your work done every night this week, whether it's um, looking at you did more chores at home, um, it, it's finding a way to really celebrate some of those small victories as part of goal setting as well. Um, have them work on things that they might not find um, interesting or preferable. Um, in so many ways, this can be seen. I have two teenage daughters right now, you know, um, taking some responsibilities for certain things at home they might not especially want to do as it relates to time management or organization. But as we look at some of those highly habits of highly effective people, when we start talking about those things now, hopefully it can set good routines and sort of um, procedures for them to follow 
to as they look later on in life for goal setting, it can come in handy as well. Again, opportunities to practice. I'll do a few more problems. I'll read a few more pages. Um, I'll complete X number of chores per week. Self-regulation skills, um, monitoring one's own behavior uh, and reinforcement. Um, teaching students how to regulate their own behavior is really important, whether it's in the classroom, whether it's related to academics, to, to work or preparing them for later on in life. Um, when we talk about self-regulation, um, uh, the first step that we really want to do is really explicitly teach some of these self-regulation strategies or calming behaviors. Um, I need a break. Um, I need to take a few minutes. Um, for some, I need to take a few deep breaths um, to find that quiet place, to think about sometimes, is it a big deal? Is it a little deal? Um, a big part of self-regulation is to teach those communication skills. I need to take a break. I need a moment. Um, practice self-regulation with games can be really a key um, and crucial part. One of the things I put with games though is um, to start is um, there's a lot of games that are non-competitive, that are team-based, um, that play really well into teaching uh, self-regulation. So the focus is not coming on somebody being a winner uh, uh, immediately as well. Um, visuals are great things, um, especially, um, you know, some of our uh, uh, zones of regulation. Um, sometimes we're, what we're, we're looking at is colors associated with self-regulation, um, blue being calm all the way up to red where we're feeling angry. Um, uh, just visual reminders for some of our kids to utilize, uh, whether it's on their, uh, an application or a device. There are apps for self-regulation, whether it's just something that might be a one-page sort of reminder, um, some of the emotions that are kept inside their binder at school, um, whether it's that self-talk process as well, um, whether talking, reminding them to be calm, those type of things as well. For some of our kids, it's movement breaks, uh, learning some of the skills related to self-regulation. For some, it might be um, work in a, a social group, um, whether with a social worker or a speech um, pathologist or a speech teacher or with their special education teacher that can come in really handy as well to really start working on some of those self-regulation strategies. Um, I'm going to stop there. Any questions so far? All right. I know I've talked a lot so far. Um, this next one, um, highlight it in your PowerPoint, star it, circle self-advocacy skills. This is going to be one of the, we've talked about the prior components of self-determination, but those prior components lead up to really self-advocacy. Um, knowing and standing up for one's rights, communicating effectively and assertively, being an effective leader or team member. It's really important that we um, teach our children how to be self-advocates, um, to stand up for themselves, to stand up for their rights, to stand up for what they need. Um, why is it important? It's gonna be something that they might need to use in school whether they need an accommodation, whether they need a break, uh, whether they need to talk to someone, all the way to work in life. Um, it's something that we need to practice. We need to start young um, so that they're able to really advocate for what they want in life in those various life domains. Strategies. We want them to express their wants and their needs and their feelings, um, to allow them those opportunities to speak for themselves, even though there's times where we might want to speak for them, um, where we might want to protect them. Um, we're going to have to spend that time to teach them to advocate for them, 
the needs, tell people what they want. When people, and this is going to come throughout, the, you know, their lifetime when um, people are speaking to us as the parents, asking us, well, what do they want? What do they need? And and the child might be there next to, to us, where we have to correct someone and say, Johnny, what do you want? And look at them. Um, it's really, really important that in, in different environments, in different contexts, we teach them to advocate for themselves, um, to teach to them to discuss the importance of being a leader and what a leader is. Um, there's an educational speaker um, by the name of Drew Dudley. And one of the things essentially talks about is that being a leader doesn't necessarily mean you have to be the president or the CEO. Uh, that leadership is done in different ways and it fits um, the person and everyone has that opportunity to, to be a leader um, and, and that people are going to be leaders in different ways. Whether it's that leader might be the person who um, leads the group, but that leader also could be that person who's the backbone of the group um, and make sure that everyone stays on task. Or that leader might be the one who brings that sense of warmth and joy to a group. Um, so having them have those opportunities throughout their lifespan to, to engage in leadership activities. Um, really having them become involved and engaged in different activities um, to, to build those leadership skills and capacities, whether it's through sports, whether it's through other activities, whether it's through dance, whether it's through, um, I know some of our kids here um, work in um, certain community activities, um, Special Olympics. Um, so really engaging in, in those leadership activities. Um, strategies, role-playing, those real-life situations, um, what happens if, uh, whether it's for the classroom, what happens if you don't understand a direction or a task, what happens if you get stuck, whether it's um, if you're at work and you don't understand a task or a direction or you run out of materials or, or something, you know, breaks or you, you're struggling with a concept or a new task, um, um, teaching them to self-advocate in preparation for a job interview uh, for some of our um, young adults who might need an accommodation in the job process. Um, the more time that we spend having them be able to express and having their voices be heard and to advocate on their behalf, um, the earlier we start, it's going to help us. Um, encourage them to become involved in extracurricular activities or clubs, service learning projects, um, building those relationships with people um, positively, um, you know, understanding, having that as we look at relationships, it should be a mutual relationship um, so that we can build that social capital and social network with people. Um, here's just a little chart, um, not encouraging self-advocacy, I think David needs, um, versus encouraging self-advocacy, I'm feeling better about math this month, but I need more about help reading longer texts. That's where I'm struggling. Um, from my own personal experience with my own son in life and for my wife, we came a point where in terms of when we look at that bubble, um, there was a time where for my son, my wife and I wanted that bubble and he didn't want that bubble. And where that time came was as he was about ready to um, accept his diploma, we really thought an extra year would have benefited him. And um, he looked at us and he basically said, I disagree. I don't want an extra year. Um, we struggled with it. Um, and it was, it was a, it was a really tough situation for us because the special educators, in a lot of ways, we still saw some of the, the gaps that 
might not have always been connected for him and where maybe that extra year would have benefited him. But we listened. And, and he wrote a proposition, sort of, and I don't want to say it in that way, a proposition. He ended up writing us with the assistance of his teachers of why he felt, and sort of it was a, a PowerPoint presentation of why he didn't need another year of school. Um, and we listened and we encouraged and we supported that. Um, and so in, in some ways with that, it was a struggle for us because yeah, we're saying self advocate, but we're thinking, but you need this. But that's where he took those skills that he had learned throughout um, life at home, but also working with the people in school and advocated for his needs. And, and then, you know, as parents, we took that time to help him generate the next stage of his plan when he exited school and, and enrolled in the community college where I live. Um, so that that can be, as we look at, there's going to be moments where it's tough sometimes as parents, because we're saying advocate for you, Sal, and, and, you know, maybe we don't necessarily agree, but that's, you know, that's where they're taking that reins of their life. They're advocating for themselves or they're, they're becoming self-determined individuals as well. Self-awareness, um, accurately identifying your own strengths and limitations, preferences, interests, and applying that to success. Um, what are we good at? What are our strengths? Um, um, you know, I know what I'm good at and there, I know certain things I'm not good at. You will never find me at, at a zoo working with snakes, ever, ever. I know that you could offer me a six-figure job with incredible benefits, it's not going to happen. I'm not working with snakes ever. And Sandy, I better not find pet snakes the next time when we meet in person. Do not do that to me. Um, but that's where finding them in, in really teaching, you know, about their strengths. Um, and this is where a lot of our individuals with disabilities, where if we can teach them to maximize their strengths, um, I had a, um, a young student that I supported in a classroom once where um, it was vacuum cleaners. He knew about the different types and different models and the, the what's the one that goes on your floor, the, the Roomba thing. And he got a job repairing vacuum cleaners right out of high school because he that was his interest. I had another student where it was sports and he could name you the sports and the various different things. And he went to work in a sports reconditioning center. Um, another student had a, a, a strong strength and awareness about himself that he liked, you know, working around an airport. So that's where he got a job in food services and airport. And every day he got to go to his happy place, the airport. Um, so I think as we look at that thing is really um, having them acknowledging their strengths um, and, and to the to greatest degree and their preference and interest um, and, and really taking advantage of those. Um, strategies, helping them realize these things, but I do well, I need help on. And that can be that I need help on can be a struggle for a lot of people, let alone some of our individuals with disabilities. Um, sometimes what we can do is really encouraging, you know, whether it's a large group discussion in like a group or a small group setting with a counselor, um, you know, assessing one's um, strengths and weaknesses in an accurate fashion as well. Um, sometimes it's about building a, a menu of options that they can choose from. Um, looking at chores, if I give them, you know, six to nine activities and they have to choose six, maybe that leads them to making that choice of six activities. Um, same thing I can do that replicate within sometimes a classroom setting, giving them, them different outlets to complete a task um, in terms of something where I want you to show your knowledge of a task. For some students, it might be a a writing activity for some um, with the, the wonderful technology that we have today. Maybe it's creating a song. Maybe it's creating a video. Maybe it's creating, you know, a flip chart. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that we can incorporate that too. 
um, really looking at self-efficacy is having that conviction that I can. I can versus I can't. I'm helping our students build that positive thought process, you know, that they can be successful um, in, in paths that they choose. Um, strategies, really setting achievable goals, um, breaking tasks into smaller steps, visualize, um, sometimes those mentoring or seeking positive role models, um, reflecting on successes, um, positive self-talk, um, learning from failures. Um, and one of the things too is also being able to accept feedback. Let's see. So as we look um, at the idea and some of the concepts related to self-determination, as we bring it together, so in another graphical um, vision of self-determination in its most simple form, it's really teaching our, uh, our children to decide, to then foster opportunities so that they act, so that they can believe in themselves. So it's that really it's comes down to we've taken those core components and skills and then we breaking it down into that action framework, which is to make a decision to act and to believe in themselves and to carrying out that task or um, objective. Some sample case studies. I just like the next couple of slides. I'm just sort of trying to bring it together to show things where self-determination can come into hand. So we have Liza um, 101. Liza is a middle school student. She's in eighth grade. She likes to participate in various activities, does dance, play soccer and softball, participates in the school choir and STEM club, wants to join the school play. Um, one of Liza's um, uh, disabilities is, is that um, she has anxiety, um, another health impairment, and which causes her anxiety to often feel overwhelmed at times. So as we look at Liza and helping her manage that ability when she feels overwhelmed, how can we use self-determination to help her um, chart a path? So looking at some of the things that we could do, she's got choices. Uh, what activities to participate in? Now, if we look at, you know, some of these choices and some of these activities, she's got a decision, a decision to make. If she participates in too many, will increase her anxiety, making her feel overwhelmed. So she's got a decision. Does she join the school play? or not, or look at sort of prioritizing what activities. Um, this is often something that comes up for a lot of our kids, um, especially in middle school and into high school. Um, I wanna do this, I wanna do that, I want a little bit of that. And then all of a sudden they're coming home and one day on a Friday, you see them at four o'clock crash on the couch and they don't wanna wake up till Saturday morning. Um, how can we help her feel less overwhelmed by problem solving, looking at some of this to manage some of that stress? Maybe we develop a plan for reducing that, that stress by managing time and the number of activities participating in. Self-regulation, we can look at monitoring that plan and developing a plan and revising as necessary. If she feels too overwhelmed, maybe we have to look at taking some of those activities off her plate and where she's making that choice and providing that insight. Um, to advocate for what activities she wants to do and not want to do. So maybe I, I wanna do the school play, but I know that's gonna be a lot of time. Maybe I choose not to do dance or participate in another activity. Um, these are skills that for a lot of us that sometimes um, we need to start to look at as part of self-determination. We, we can't say yes, 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 yes to everything. And, and that's really one of the reflective cases here, um, managing time. 
So a struggling first year college student, James, attends a, a local community college, taking her for full course load, um, wants to pursue a career in business, struggling in his math class, failed the first quiz, failed the second quiz. His first test is coming up. But, you know, James at, you know, 19, maybe at 20, depending on his age. Um, there's a big concert. Everyone's going. But he's got a test tomorrow. So teaching him what decisions do we make and self-determination through the lens of self-determination. Choice. Go out or study. Decide on how much time it goes into studying based on that choice. Identifying that, if we look at that struggle in math class, um, identifying his area of struggle. Is it the math part that he's struggling with? Is it is he just not studying right for the, the, the quizzes and what might be the test? Is it the time management if he decides to go out for the concert and not study for the test? Um, what we can look at then doing is having him set a goal to improve performance and develop a plan. Um, I really want to go out for the concert, but I really need to study more um, so I get a better grade. And then there will be more concerts to come, but I really need to focus this time on the math and study. Um, monitoring that performance and revising that plan. Um, so looking at for some of our kids within, or in this case, James, in this situation, maybe on particular units where he needs to uh, study more versus other units, um, um, maybe he needs to study, study less and just has that ability to reallot that time. Um, for some, it's I failed test one, I failed test two. Um, maybe it's advocating for what help I need. Um, maybe I should get a tutor. Um, and maybe that tutor who might be a peer at school can help me uh, understand some of the concepts that I'm missing. Give me some extra practice. Um, and, and that's one of the most important things for some of our transition age kids. When we talk about that, asking for help is, um, you know, rather than say fail te one test, fail one quiz, a second quiz, and then fail the test. Hey, if, you know, I struggled with that first quiz or that second quiz, it's all right to ask somebody for help to go to a tutoring center, whether it's in math or writing. Um, because those are the things that exist on college campuses. But the biggest thing to understand and know is that you have to ask for those things as you move from a school setting or a, in, in high school to a post-secondary setting. Self-awareness, maybe he realizes that it's just test-taking skills in general that he struggles with. So what, what can he do to improve test-taking skills and utilize some of the uh, accommodations that it might be granted, such as extended test time. You know, okay, I got to slow down, maybe create some visuals for myself when I receive the test, um, use some of the mnemonic strategies as well, incorporate it into that test taking strategy to improve my performance. I don't have time here to show this, but this is something that I want you all to watch um, afterwards. Um, and it, it's probably one of the biggest takeaways of what self-determination is and self-advocacy. So after tonight, if you just have time, it's about a 10-minute clip. Um, it's with C. Thomas Howell. Um, it's really, really powerful. Um, I would encourage you to watch it. And then um, maybe the next time you guys meet, it might be a good thing to, to discuss for just a few minutes. It's a really, really powerful clip. Um, it's just about 10 minutes long, though, and I'm sorry for falling short on time. Um, so some of the resources I put in here, there's some different resources. I just want to open up. Give me one second. I want to open up and show the Padlet as well to go over that. Oh, did it ask for a passcode, Sandy? I will update that. I will put another... Um, I'll attach another file then in the on the Padlet after the presentation. 
It's a really great video though. Give me one second for the Padlet. Mm. So this is a Padlet that I created with some different resources. Um, here's the PowerPoint presentation. I'll add to it uh, th that video link for that video. Um, that's really, really powerful. Um, here is some resources on a student-led IP, um, which can be a great um, experience for students to go through um, and exercise in self-determination and self-advocacy. This website, I'm Determined Here, has a ton of resources and information. Um, it's divided into sections for educators, but also for parents and for students as well. Um, they have a conference each year. There's a youth credo. There's a lot of resources on here. There's an I'm Determined Self to Toolbox, determin Determination Toolbox. Some of the resources on here that are also really good for students there's a one pager um, that comes up. Um, no, it didn't. It will basically look at to help others to get to know you. So it represents for an individual to fill out um, categories about that they can give for other people to help under understand their wants and their needs. Oops, I'm stuck. So give me one second. Hold on, and I'm going to bring it up. Sorry, hold on with me one second. So here's what it comes up, the one pager. It talks about strengths. It talks about interests. It talks about preferences. It talks about needs. Um, it gives a short video clip of how to fill it out. Um, the nice part then underneath is there's the one page overview from the youth perspective. Great resource, great tool, um, whether they're meeting new people, if they're joining a new group, a new class, a new youth group, a new activity outside of school, really great resource to use. Um, some of the other resources on the Padlet. Oops. Hold on, I'm just switching back and forth. Um, on that here, there's also a good day plan from I'm Determined what it might look like, a goal setting plan um, that can be used. Um, they have a parent path to success, some resources from the parent lens as it relates to self-determination. And then there's some different um, enhancing self-determination for transition. Um, if you have a whoop, son or daughter who's of transition age, some different activities to help as it relates there as well. And there's some different modules. Um, but really, um, the one of the biggest resources that I would really encourage you to look at is that I'm determined website and modules that exist on there. Um, Cause be, there are some of the resources are youth specific and also family specific. So that's all I have. Are there questions or comments? Sandy, it's back to you then. Ariba, it's back to you. Chris, I just want to say thank you very much for the presentation. Um, it was very helpful. And I was sitting here and I was thinking, I wish I had some of this information in um very, very early in um, my life as a as a mother. So thank you. You're welcome and thank you for coming. Yeah, thanks.
There was one thing earlier on, I didn't want to jump in when you were talking, but there's a great book called The Gift of Failure um, that I read, you know, just as I was trying to navigate, you know, kids and life and also being an educator. And um, I, I definitely recommend it for anybody on the call. It was it was great because so many times you want to protect and you think you're protecting and you think you're doing the right thing and you end up kind of doing the opposite because we don't let the kids have those experiences themselves. And, and, and I think that's one of the, the things that I, I learned most, both as a professional and as a parent is that exactly is trying to remove that bubble and understanding those things. And, and, and sometimes realizing if it's, if it's me, how can I get out of the way? And how can I not be the barrier anymore? And, and uh, one of the things was driving. I made the decision. I'm not going to do it because that's, I was the barrier with driving. So we hired a driving company to do the license and the everything else. So because 90% of the time with the driving, it was me. I'll be the first one to admit it because I was like, I just want the extra wheel. I want extra brakes. You know, I want, you know, a sign saying you driver, get out of the way. So I think, you know, allowing, you know, you know, those digging your wrist, that ability to go through things and have those productive struggles through things is such a meaningful process for our youth with disabilities. Oh my gosh, Chris. If you've ever attended one of Chris's transition workshops, you walk away really overwhelmed because there's so many components of transition, but he does such a good job of walking you through and it's, I don't know, probably over a hundred page slide. This one I thought, oh, we're going to just do self-determination. And again, he's a fountain of information and chock full of resources. Um, and I have to learn this Padlet thing that you um, have introduced me to. We have the transition Padlet, and now we have the self-determination um, Padlet. So again, I just appreciate that you're willing to share, um, you know, who knew that choice-making, decision-making, problem-solving, goal-setting, self-regulation, self-advocacy, leadership, self-awareness, and self-efficacy all fall under <laughs> self-determination. So, so thank you for putting all that work into the presentation for us. Yeah. And, and, and I think one of the things that, and, and Sandy, I know I've mentioned to you, I think the one of the biggest things that I, I really like coming and working with you guys and also Jamie and the acting is you having this group, having this resource group for, for, for each other it is really going to be big in so many ways because it's something you can say as a group, we can fall back on and say, did you go through this? And you're like, I went through this, or did you see this? And and you know, and and I, and I often say when I do a lot of my parent trainings is, it gives us that opportunity to say, "Oh my God, you wouldn't believe what happened today." And I think Reba, you were even looking at that a little bit earlier when I jumped on, and you know, having the ability to, I just have to laugh about this one because if I didn't laugh today, you know, I would be just what little hair I have left, I'd be tearing out. But um, thank you for everyone for taking the time out tonight as well. Um, and I want to thank everyone for coming as well. And please make sure to fill out the survey. You know, let us know any other topics too. Let us know how fabulous Chris was. And I don't know how he could have made it better. But if you choose to say that there is, then we'll listen to that too. There's plenty of ways. <laughs> <laughs> So we want your feedback and the, the survey is in the, or the evaluation link is in there. Um, upcoming for our Methacton SEA Home and School on November 20th at seven o'clock, uh, we'll be meeting at the library and Dr. Danny Felsen will be providing a sky view and our, our COLA special education staffing um, and resources information session for us. Then in November, our presentation, um, for the month is with Dr. Steve Stunder from Chestnut Hill College on college access for neurodiverse students. That's November 21st at seven o'clock and that, well, we're, we're considering 
typically these presentation meetings are Zoom, but I think there is consideration for having it in person. And my guess it would be at the library, right? If, you know, if we can schedule it there, but we'll put out information on that. And then don't forget our annual Kendra Scott fundraiser um, is going to be held December 13th through the 15th. Uh, stay tuned for flyers and details and know that um, Christmas and Hanukkah fall very close so you can shop for either and all holidays. Um, so again, thank you. And we hope you enjoyed Chris's presentation and we'll be sending out the recording and the Padlet information as well. And I'll add up on uh, tomorrow, I'll add the link in. I'll find the right link to add in too. I did put the escalator and I figured out why I couldn't do it. I had two Chromebook icons up and I was going to the wrong one. So I felt better Sorry. after that because I felt really goofy that I couldn't pull it up. But it's funny. Take time to watch that too. All right, everyone. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a good night.